Indeed, it is our goal to live in glory by and by. Amen. The, the time that we live in this life uh, is but for a moment. Uh, man born of woman, Job said, is a few days and full of trouble. We shan't be here long. And so it is incumbent upon us to make preparations for our final destination. And it is our prayer that your desire for that final destination will be in home, uh, will be in heaven in glory uh, by and by. We pray and we thank uh, our visiting uh, friends for being with us on this morning. And we pray that your goal uh, is to make heaven your eternal home. One of the great revelations of the Bible is that many will be, many more will be lost than will be saved. And so it is our petition and our prayer uh, that you will seek the Lord while he may still uh, be found. Uh, on this morning, and welcome to the services of the Church of Christ in Goose Creek. Amen. On this morning, we want to examine, if you will, the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter number 18. We want to look particularly at verse number 20 through 25. Genesis chapter number 18, verse 20 through 25. Amen. Uh, listen to the reading of the word of God. Listen to your Bible. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grave. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood still before the Lord. And Abraham uh, came near and said, Would you also destroy uh, the righteous with uh, the wicked? Suppose there were fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that were in it? Verse number 25, far be it from you, uh, for, from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall the judge of all the earth do right? Let all those who believe and agree, uh, amen, to the reading of the word, say amen, wherever you may be. Uh, amen. On this morning, I'd like for us to consider for a subject, uh, the advocate, the judge, and justice. The advocate, the judge, and justice. Uh, back in 1995, I uh, uh, came across an account where uh, an individual by the name of Bobby Bostick uh, he got incarcerated for carjacking uh, and armed robbery. There were some good Samaritans in the inner city and they were uh, passing out food and bringing supplies to those who were living in uh, subpar uh, places, stand substandard living. And uh, Bobby Bostick and another individual decided that they would rob them and uh, they had a gun, and the gun went off, and it grazed an individual. It didn't kill no one, uh, amen, and nevertheless, uh, amen, uh, they took off from there, and they uh, carjacked uh, another couple, took their vehicle. Well, Bobby Bostick and uh, his accomplice uh, were uh, caught by the police, uh, and when the day of their trial came, or Bobby Bostick in particular, um, he was sentenced to 241 years. Uh, and the account lets us know, the uh, report lets us know that when the judge looked at Bobby Bostick, who was 16 years old at the time, a uh, female judge, she saw an individual that did not appear to have any redeeming qualities whatsoever. She had the choice to uh, allow his uh, sentence to run either concurrently or consecutively. And so there were 17 charges that were brought up against Bobby Bostick. Uh, and so instead of allowing the charges to run concurrently, uh, simultaneously, um, she gave him 241 years uh, consecutively for each charge that added up. Uh, and so as I look at this uh, particular account, uh, Bobby Bostick's been in prison for over 20 plus years, almost 30 some odd years, and it is a great travesty of justice. Uh, and so while he is incarcerated and have been incarcerated, 
Uh, he has grown up in prison. He has changed his life. He has gotten his diploma. He has gotten his college uh, degree. He has written 15 books. He is a role model in uh, the prison penitentiary. And he's holding on to hope that one day he can be set free. What's interesting about this account is that the very same judge that gave him 241 years now retired is his main advocate uh, for release. And this judge have apologized and looked at the sentence and uh, certainly come to terms with the fact that her sentence for this individual amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. And so they petitioned the Supreme Court and they're working through the judicial court, judicial system to reverse the charges uh, that Bobby might be set free. But what was interesting to me is how the judge initially saw Bobby, this uh, teenager, this young uh, boy, as one who had no redeeming qualities whatsoever. I want us to uh, recognize that even among uh, the worst of us, there is good in all of us. And that's one of the things that we have to understand. It doesn't matter your past and, and your present. I want us to understand they're not necessarily the requisite for your future in Christ. Amen. We can turn our life around in Christ. Uh, we can be better than we have been. And so when I thought about this judge and this uh, unjust judgment given, uh, amen, a teenager, 241 years, this judge uh, recognized uh, over the period of time, she said that her understanding has uh, evolved and she recognizes that the brain uh, of, a ten, of a teenager versus, uh, amen, an adult is different. And so she is very much remorseful. And so when I thought about this judge and uh, the travesty of uh, justice, uh, cruel and unusual punishment, I thought about God. And when we look at uh, this particular passage, uh, particularly in verse number uh, 25, the last sentence, Abraham says to the Lord, shall the judge of all the earth do right? I want us to understand that man might not do right, but thank God there's a judge on high, amen, that will do right where man will not. And so when we think about this particular passage, we see in the text, amen, that the Lord, amen, recognized the outcry of a wicked city called Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, the two uh, twin cities given over uh, to vile sin, uh, to uh, perversion, to uh, degeneration, amen, and, and their sin was uh, so notorious uh, in the history of humanity where we read that uh, God wiped Sodom and Gomorrah off the face uh, of the planet. I want us to understand that there was some wickedness in Sodom and in Gomorrah. Amen. And when we look at the text uh, to get a little bit of flavor of what was taking place uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter number 19, uh, amen. Well, uh, in our text in chapter number uh, 18 and verse 22, uh, the men that were with the Lord, these two uh, angelic beings, they head towards Sodom. And in chapter number 19, and verse number uh, one, the Bible lets us know when they uh, get to Sodom, they were sitting uh, at the gate uh, of this wicked city of Sodom. A amen. And Lot, a amen, Abraham's nephew, sees uh, these two uh, angelic beings there uh, sitting, amen, uh, amen, in at the gate of Sodom. And, and he bid that they would come and stay with him. They wanted to stay in the open square, but a lot was insistent that they not stay in the open square in that wicked city. Well, the Bible lets us know, amen, that the men of the city, amen, got word that these two visitors, amen, that came to the city uh, had went into the house of Lot. 
And so they came from all four corners of the city and descended on uh, the house of Lot. And they were banging on the door. And they say in verse number five of chapter number 19, where are the men uh, who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Amen. They wanted to commit Amen. Wickedness, homosexuality uh, had run uh, and perversion had run rampant uh, in these two uh, twin cities. So much so that Lot uh, offered, amen, uh, his virgin, his two virgin daughters uh, to the wicked men that they might leave the house alone and not cohabitate or attack or cost uh, the two angelic uh, visitors that came into the city. Well, the men did not want their virgin daughters. The men wanted to know know these two angels who uh, came in, uh, in human form. They wanted to know them uh, carnally. And so I want us to understand how vile, how wicked, how evil, amen, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were. When we look at further uh, amen. Descriptions of Sodom and Gomorrah in uh, the New Testament book of Jude, Jude 1, only one chapter in Jude, Jude 1 and verse number uh, 7. The Bible uh, says these words, as Sodom and Gomorrah uh, and the cities around in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so we see that the wickedness in these cities uh, got the attention of God so much so that the Lord came down with these two angels and dispatched the angels to destroy these two twin cities. When you turn the page to Second Peter chapter number two and verse number six, uh, Peter recounts, Amen, Sodom and Gomorrah. And Peter says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, uh, condemn them to destruction, making them, here it come again, an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Uh, amen. I want us to understand that God hates sin. Amen. And such sin as was taking place in Sodom and Gomorrah caused God to act in this very unique way by wiping Sodom and Gomorrah off the face of the earth, raining down fire and brimstone. A amen. A and so when we look over in Romans chapter number one, in Romans chapter uh, number one, and you uh, drop down to verse number 26, Romans 1 and 26, listen to the apostle Paul. Paul's talking about the type of wickedness that was taking place in Sodom and in Gomorrah. Paul says, for this reason, here it comes, God gave them up uh, to vile passions. Uh, for even their women exchanged, here it comes, the natural use for what is against nature. Uh, likewise, also the men, uh, leaving the natural use of uh, the woman burned in their lust uh, for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error uh, which was due. A amen. A and even as they did not like, uh, amen, to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased uh, amen, mind to do those things which are not fitting. We have to understand that we're living in these times today where men and women feel that they can live any kind of way without any recourse, amen, from Almighty God. And so we have to recognize, amen, that there are folk that are confused in terms of their gender. There are, are folk that are just caught up in this wickedness Amen. And homosexuality is not the only sin on the planet. And even among those who are homosexual, homosexuals or uh, lesbians, they're still good and even the worst of us. Amen. And so when we look in our particular text, amen, uh, Abraham 
uh, advocates. Abraham intercedes on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. No doubt Abraham's thinking about his nephew Lot that lives in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham advocates, he uh, uh, intercedes on their behalf. He petitions God, uh, amen, on behalf of this wicked city. And so Abraham says, and uh, amen, verse number uh, 23, uh, would you destroy uh, the righteous with uh, the wicked? A amen. And, and so Abraham was very much concerned. Amen. That uh, amen. That there's a lot of uh, wicked folk, but there are also some good folk among the wicked folk in that then uh, city. Uh, much like today, there are still some good folk. Uh, amen. In this wicked world, now, I want us to recognize that. Amen. God is a just God. Uh, amen. And even at our worst, God still loves us. It recalls to my attention uh, Psalm 8 and verse number 4, where David uh, asked the question, uh, amen, uh, he says, what is man uh, that you are mindful of him, uh, and the son of man that you uh, visit him, that word visit, uh, translation uh, word visit means give attention uh, to or care for, in other words, David is saying, man after God's own heart, what is man that you are even concerned with our wretchedness? Uh, amen. He says in verse 5 of uh, Psalm 8, he says, You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have uh, made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, verse number nine, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And so we have to recognize that God loves man. Even at our worst, God is still at his best. When you look at Psalm 7 and verse uh, number 11, amen, uh, David said, God is a just judge, a amen, a amen, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Verse 12, if he does not turn back, he that is God will sharpen his sword. Uh, he bends his bow and makes it ready. He prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. I want us to understand that just because God is long suffering with man does not mean that God, amen, will overlook sin. And so we have to come to terms with the fact that God loves us, uh, amen, he loved the sinner, but he hates the sin. And so when I think about uh, uh, Abraham interceding on behalf of the land, you got some righteous among the wicked, amen. I want us to know that uh, today in particular, in regard to the child of God, Jesus is our advocate. Over there in 1 John chapter number 2 and Verse number one, first John two and one, John says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate uh, with the father, Jesus, uh, the righteous. Aren't you glad? A amen. That uh, we have an advocate, uh, Jesus, the Christ, A amen, that uh, is uh, amen, the go-between between humanity and, and divinity uh, to advocate, to uh, intercede in our stead. In Romans chapter number eight and verse number uh, 34, uh, Paul says, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, risen who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. And, and so that intercession, that uh, petition on behalf of another, thank God for Jesus Christ. And, and, and as a child of God, it's important that we understand that like Abraham, we are to intercede. We are to pray. We are to petition God. A amen. Not uh, uh, just on behalf of those that we know and those that we love, 
but on behalf of the wicked in this world, on behalf of those that persecute us in this world, on behalf of those, amen, that look like they have no redeeming qualities in this world, I want you to know that God uh, loves us all. And, and so when I think uh, about one that acts as Abraham interceding on behalf of a wicked city given over to immorality. It reminds me of Jesus himself, who not only makes intercession for us to the Father, but also made intercession on behalf of Peter uh, that fateful night uh, before uh, they went down to the Garden of Gethsemane, the uh, Mount of Olives in Luke chapter number 22. In Luke chapter 22 and verse number 31, I want us to notice, amen, that uh, Jesus was an advocate making intercession uh, on behalf of Peter in particular. And, and Jesus says, Simon, Simon, amen, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Here it comes. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Aren't you glad that there's somebody that can pray on your behalf? Aren't you glad that Jesus makes intercession on our behalf? He's an advocate, even though we are guilty of our sin. It, it recalls to my attention Moses and how uh, leading up to the great deliverance of the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage in the midst of the plagues, particularly the fourth plague, uh, where Pharaoh petitions Moses to intercede on his behalf. Pharaoh, a, a man that refused to let God's people go, had the audacity to ask Moses to pray for him. In Exodus chapter number 8 and verse number 27, I, I want us to see, amen, how Moses, uh, amen, uh, interceded on behalf of Pharaoh. Uh, the Bible says, we'll, we, uh, we will go three days, listen to Moses, uh, journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he will command us. Verse 28, so Pharaoh says, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness only you shall not go very far away. Then he says, intercede for me. You know, old wicked Pharaoh, all he wanted was the flies to go away. And there's some wicked folk today who get themselves in such a mess that they want you to pray. Not that they will change their life, but that their conditions might change. Amen. Nevertheless, as children of God, we need to pray. Uh, for this wicked world. And I want us to always remember that even among the worst of us, there's some good in all of us. When I think about those that are not spoken of highly in the holy writ of God's word, it reminds me of the harlot, the tax collector, and the Samaritan. The harlot, the tax collector, and the Samaritan. In Luke chapter number seven, if you are familiar Verse number 36 and following, the Bible lets us know that Jesus was invited to the house of a Pharisee and they sat down to eat. Verse 37, and behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus had sat at the table at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Well, the account lets us know that uh, she was weeping behind Jesus' feet. Uh, amen. And she, uh, amen, anointed uh, his feet and, uh, and her tears and, and wiped his feet with uh, uh, her hair. And uh, amen. And, 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 uh, amen. And washed the feet with uh, her tears. We have a woman who's described in scripture as only a sinner. And the host, amen, that invites Jenna, Jesus uh, to this dinner. Uh, says within himself, if uh, a, this man or Jesus were a prophet, uh, he would know who this is who is touching him. Most theologians and scholars surmise that this woman who's only identified as a sinner was a harlot in the city. 
No doubt she was uh, weighed down and grievous. A amen. As, as it relates to her life, uh, perhaps you don't know her story. And that's another thing we got to recognize. We don't know one another's story. We don't know what someone have had to go through. And so here's this woman uh, laden down and burdened down with sins who takes a man, uh, her burdens to the Lord. Didn't Jesus say, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. A amen. And so she brings her burdens uh, to the Lord. And Jesus says to, silent, to Simon, he says that, that when I came to your house, uh, you gave me no water for my feet. When I came to your house, you did not anoint my head with water, uh, with, with, with oil like this woman. Uh, when I came to your house, uh, you didn't even give me the, the greeting of a kiss. And this woman has not ceased uh, to kiss uh, my feet. And Jesus said, this woman uh, whose sins are many are forgiven. Uh, I want us to recognize that many folk who are Amen. In a sinful situation, uh, amen, a perilous condition and, and in terms of their uh, sinful lifestyle, a amen, are, are many people who have a uh, good all up in them. A amen. This woman was burdened. She comes to Jesus and Jesus forgives her sin. A amen. And so I want us to recognize, a amen, that we ought not look down on no one except to lift one up uh, from their condition. When you look over there in Luke chapter number 19, uh, Jews, amen, had a problem with the tax collectors, particularly of their own nation, because the tax collectors in biblical days would often exact taxes more than you owed. And they were able to do that working for the Roman government, uh, who was no friend of the Jews, against the Jews, and you're a Jew collecting taxes, and you're taking more than you should. And so tax collectors were despised uh, among the people. But in Luke 19, verse number one and following, many of you should be familiar with this account. The Bible lets us know that Jesus entered and passed through the city of Jericho. And behold, there was a man uh, named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector and was rich. So he wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. So no doubt he had no love from his own people, but he heard that Jesus was coming in town. And, and so he uh, climbs up, amen, a, 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 a sycamore tree. A, amen. A, amen. A, a, and this man wanted to see Jesus. When Jesus came uh, his way, Jesus looks up and sees uh, Zacchaeus, this rich tax collector, and says that I'm going to stay with you, uh, amen, tonight, uh, amen, uh, to the chagrin of those around him. And I could see them rolling uh, their eyes saying, oh, he has gone to stay with a, a tax collector. And, and Jesus uh, lets them know, uh, amen, that he have come for the sick. He have come for uh, sinners. And, and, and Zacchaeus says that I give half my goods to the poor. Zacchaeus said, and if I have defrauded anyone, I, I restore four, four, fourfold. And so he had a penitent heart. Uh, he wanted, uh, amen, uh, amen, to uh, see Jesus. He wanted to be in fellowship with the Lord. He wanted to do the right thing. He was a chief tax collector, not thought of in a positive sense, amen, but in the text, we can see the heart of this man who was not thought of much by the populace. And finally, there's the Samaritan. The Samaritan, Jews and uh, Samaritans had no dealings, amen. Uh, the Jewish nation saw uh, Samaritans as dogs. I'm trying to describe to us folk that many folk don't think much of, but I want us to know that God still loves them. God went to Zacchaeus' home. Uh, God and Jesus Christ uh, forgave the harlot of all the sins that have been laden her down. But when you look at Luke 17 and verse number 12 and following, the Bible lets us know that Jesus enters a certain village and there he meets 
10 men who have leprosy. They lift up their voices and they say, Jesus, uh, Master, have mercy on us. When Jesus saw them, he says, go show yourselves to the priests. And the Bible lets us know that while they were on their way, they were cured from this incurable physical disease called leprosy. And one out of the 10, after realizing that he had been cured, he comes back to Jesus. And when he comes back to Jesus, uh, with a loud voice, he glorifies God with his face down to the feet of Jesus, giving thanks. And the Bible says, and he was a Samaritan. And so I want us to understand that even among the so-called worst of us, God loves all of us. And so when we think about uh, Abraham in our text, advocating on behalf of these wicked cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, will you destroy the righteous along with the wicked? He starts at 50. Will you spare the city for 50? What about 45? What about 30? What about 20? What about 10? And God working with Abraham, God who's a long-suffering God, God who's a patient God, God, amen, who loves us in spite of us said, I will not destroy the city for 10. Well, you know the story. They couldn't find 10. And as a result, uh, Lot, uh, his two daughters, and his wife were the only ones that left out of Sodom and Gomorrah, led by the, the angels that came to visit the city. Uh, amen. And God rained down fire and brimstone and wiped out this wicked, immoral, perverted, degenerate, uh, amen, uh, land in which the wicked dwelled. Uh, amen. Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. But let's look at the judge. I want us to know that when we think about the judge, uh, the inference is that the judge will render a judgment uh, in concert with justice. And I want us to understand that we serve a just God. Where man falls short, there's a God that's just. And on the one hand, that's a good thing. And on the other hand, I want to admonish us to be mindful that God's not only a just God, amen, a merciful God, but he's a just God. And one thing you don't want is the justice of God, although he's a just God. In Deuteronomy chapter number 32, in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse number four, uh, listen to your Bible. The Bible said he is the rock, amen. His work is perfect. God's a rock, his work is perfect. Perfect for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. It's good to know that where man will fail, God is a just God. Amen. And so when God renders a verdict, you need to know, amen, that it's a just verdict. When I think about Moses and Moses needed some help. Uh, amen, uh, with the people, uh, two plus million people of the children of Israel. And Moses could not, uh, amen, uh, manage everybody himself alone. And so he appointed judges. In Deuteronomy chapter number one and verse number 16, uh, Moses is writing to the second generation of the children of Israel. And he's recounting an episode where uh, his father-in-law Jethro admonishes him to, amen, appoint judges that can help him uh, manage the people in terms of uh, uh, interceding and, uh, amen, uh, giving just cause to the affairs of God's people. Uh, Moses says in Deuteronomy 1 and 16, then I commanded your judges, he's reminding the people, at that time saying, hear the cases between your brethren. And judge how so righteously between a man and his brother or the stranger who is uh, with him. A amen. And verse 17, he says, uh, show no 
partiality. And so a judge is not to show partiality. Amen. And so when we think about God and you compare the just God that he is to man, Jesus was teaching in Luke chapter number 18 that we should always pray and not lose heart. And he tells a story about an unjust judge. And he says in Luke 18 and 2, there was in a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. He said there was a widow in the city that said, get justice for me from my adversary. He says that the judge would not for a while. A amen. But the widow continued to trouble him and continued to bring her case before the unjust judge. And the judge thought in himself that, amen, I better do something lest this woman wear me out or weary me. And then the Bible lets us know in uh, verse number six, Jesus said, did you hear what the unjust judge said? And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? We serve a just God. A amen. And while that might sound good, and it is good, uh, the problem is we are not good. And so what we have to recognize is that there's no sinner that's a bigger sinner than someone else. The Bible still says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. A amen. And so when we recognize that we are all, humanity fall under the population of all who have transgressed, who have committed iniquity, who have sinned before God. The Bible lets us know in Romans 6 and 23 that the wages of sin, there's a penalty, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so we have to recognize the opportunity that we have not to seek justice, but to seek his mercy. Not to seek justice, but to seek his grace. Not to seek justice, but plead, amen, on the blood of Jesus Christ for the saving of my soul. I remember Amos says over there in Amos 5 and 24, uh, Amos says, let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Amen. The prophets of old, uh, they were champions of social justice. Amen. And they, uh, uh, amen. They often, uh, amen. Justice was often uh, perverted by uh, bribery, uh, favoritism, or partiality. Uh, amen. But Amos says, let uh, justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Well, there's a problem with that. And the only problem is, uh, amen, that there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3 and verse number 10. And so when I think about Genesis uh, 18, where Abraham says, will you destroy uh, the righteous with the wicked? God could have simply said that there's none righteous. No, not one. But instead of God responding uh, to Abraham, uh, amen, in such a definitive way, God wants us to know that he's willing to work with us, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and because all men uh, amen, have sin, and there's none righteous, no, not one, God was looking to Jesus, who in the corridors of time would do for us what we could not do for uh, ourselves. And so we have to recognize that one day we're all going to have to stand, stand uh, amen, before a just judge. And in standing before a just judge, you want to make sure that you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 12 and following, the Bible says, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. Uh, we're going to have to stand before God. And, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged, amen, according to their works. That's why you want to make sure you're in Christ. By the things which were written in the books, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one, according to his works. And so I want us to understand, and then he said in verse 15, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast 
into the lake of fire. I, I want us to know that we're going to be judged one day. Amen. And we're going to be judged by a just judge. And, and, and it, was it was just in the sight of God to allow his son to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. A amen. He, a amen. Uh, he bore our sins in his own body to give us the right to the tree of life, to give us access to glory throughout endless ages in eternity. If you recall, lastly, I'll just give you this and we'll say goodbye. In Luke chapter number 15, uh, the Bible tells us about the prodigal son. It's really uh, a parable about the love of the father. A and you know the story. Uh, the story lets us know that a, a man that one of the sons, uh, the younger of the two sons, decided that he no longer wanted to live under his father's rule. A and so, uh, a man, before his father died, he says, give me my inheritance, all disrespectful. Well, the father divides the inheritance with the younger and the older son. The younger son grabs his stuff and goes out into the far country, lives a waste, wasteful or riotous life. When he spent all that he had, there was a famine in the land and to survive, he joined himself to one of the citizens of the land and found himself in the hog pen of life. You know the story. He comes to himself in the hog pen of life and realizes that it was better in my father's house. And so he decides that he's going to go back to his father's house and uh, he's going to, uh, amen, uh, say to his father, make me uh, like one of uh, your uh, hired servants. But here's my point. I want us to understand that the judge is not just the judge, but he's also a father. And I want us to know that while we're going to stand before Jesus, Jesus is in the father and the father's in Jesus. But watch what the Bible says. In verse number 20 of Luke 15, the Bible says, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. I want you to know God sees you. Amen. And had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. It's important that we understand the culture of Middle Eastern uh, nurse. Uh, in, in that at this day and time, uh, you would not see uh, a man, a grown man run. Uh, amen. Not that he couldn't run. But it was undignified to run. They would wear long robes. Uh, amen. And, and he sees his son coming. But instead of walking to his son, uh, he runs to his son. And in order to run to his son, he had to gird up his robes. And in girding up his robes, he had to show his legs. Uh, amen. Which was, uh, amen, uh, disrespectful. Uh, amen. But the father had love for the son. Amen. And he uh, girds up his loins and runs to his son while he's still a yet afar a off. And he says, bring out the best robe. He says, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals are on his feet. And uh, Amen. And bring the fatted calf. Kill it. Amen. That we might eat and be merry. And then he said, for this my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they begin to make merry. I want us to understand that God, in His infinite love, was willing, amen, to take on our shame that we might have a relationship with Him. In Hebrews chapter number 12, amen, the Bible lets us know in verse number 2. Verse number one, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us here come run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto who? Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Here come who for the joy. Amen. Watch it now. Here's, here's God, who for the joy that was set before him uh, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to know that God had no problem, amen, uh, exposing himself to the world. 
When Jesus was up on the cross, he was naked on that cross. Uh, the shame before the world, insulted before the world, uh, hey, stretched out wide and hung up high. Amen. And they scourged him before the world. He was willing because of his love for us to despise the shame. Amen. Endured the cross. Amen. And now has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. God was willing to take on the shame of our sin that we might have a relationship with him. That the worst of us might put away our sin that we might, amen, accept Christ on his turn. If you are with us on this morning and you are distant from God, I don't care what you have done. The blood of Jesus Christ is able to cleanse your today's sin, your yesterday's sin, and even your tomorrow's sin. But you have to decide that I want the love of God, a just God, who have made a way for me to be right although I'm wrong, that I might have the hope of heaven through Jesus the Christ. The way that you come to Christ, to the saving of your soul, irrespective of your past life, is to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. When you believe that the son, Jesus the Christ, hung, bled, and died for your sin and for mine, but early one Sunday morning he rose up with all power in his hand, despising the shame, uh, enduring the cross. He rose up, a, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he's there to advocate. He's there to intercede. He's there because he loves us, and the choice is yours. If you want to make heaven your home, he died that we might live. If you understand the message of the cross and believe it with all your heart, Hebrews eleven six, willing to repent of your sin. I've got to change my life. Amen. Because I want to make heaven my home. Amen. Uh, Luke 13, 3, confess Jesus to be Lord, Matthew 10, 32, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. God will add you to the church. I want us to understand that you can be like Bobby Bostick, amen, where you stood before a judge and the judge said that you are worthless, that, that there's no redeeming qualities in you. God says, I see some good in you. God says that don't you worry about man's judgment. I've got the ultimate judgment and I can save your soul. What can wash away my sin but nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. You ought to come to Jesus because if you're, amen, no man, you ain't going to get justice among man. Amen. But God is not only just, but he's the justifier and we receive justice we are declared righteous, not that we are right, but the blood of Jesus Christ can make us right in Christ Jesus. And so if you're subject to the call of Christ, contact us at the Church of Christ. We're at 539 Old Monk's Corner Road, Goose Creek, South Carolina. Contact us via the web, www.goosecreekchurchofchrist.com. We want every man, God wants every man to accept Amen. His pardon to accept his plea to accept. Amen. Salvation on the basis of his son's sacrifice. Despise your shame. Endure the cross that we might come to the father who's also the judge and receive. Amen. The pardon for the sin of our soul. Why don't you become a Christian even on this morning? Amen. May God bless, strengthen and keep you.